Stocks now red as the Russell drags post-inflation bonds finally seeming to come to grips with warm data as yields are rising. Tom White's here with me in the studio. Eric Lynch is on the line. We're going to talk some uh, earnings ahead of us, but also a little general discussion about markets here. Eric's managing director at Sharp Investments. Always got a good macro take. So let's start there, Eric. Does now two months of seemingly hot inflation data limit how much this rally can broaden out? I don't think so. You know, I think what's interesting is a good question, though, Oliver. Uh, you've got this kind of hotter inflation level, but, you know, things are normalizing. You see it with uh, you know, consumer behavior. Jobs is still maintaining healthy levels. The last three months of job additions has averaged 265,000. Wage growth is still in place. So the Fed has not killed things. And what's really interesting is ever since uh, the October lows, you know, equities are are running and it's not just nasdaq and tech like it was in 2023 where the nasdaq was up 40 over 50 percent roughly and uh, it sector is up 55 percent it's things like value stocks and international stocks and from a sector perspective even things like financials and uh and healthcare. so things are definitely broadening out um ever since then and there's still a lot of i think uh potential for that because tech has really dominated for uh, over a decade I've watched the Russell as kind of a uh, lazy sort of benchmark for rotation. You know, does the small cap world join in to the mega cap one? Not quite the same as some of the sector rotation and broadening that we're looking at a chart that you brought here showing, yeah, there's other groups participating. But when I think about it from the market cap scale as kind of a starting point, this Russell seems like it's one of the areas that has problems with rates. How far does that extend into other sectors? I mean, if you don't have big, booming AI growth right now, will you be more sensitive if rates start going higher again, which they kind of are right now? Yeah, I, I do think that some of the smaller businesses could be impacted if interest rates, you know, uh, keep, keep increasing actually from here. Uh, you know, these, these companies have a higher cost of capital. It impacts them more than a, a larger institution. So that could happen. Uh, however, you know, what I'd also say is, you know, there, there is basically still a healthy economy. Now, it's hard to say whether that, that lasts for six months or two years or 10 years, but it's still a pretty healthy economy. And there is money to be made, earnings to be made in some of these smaller businesses even. So, you know, I think the valuation opportunities, Oliver, are definitely still attractive outside of tech, including small caps. When you look inside of tech, inside of uh, the strength of this market, what still looks like it's got room to run here. Some of the stuff has gotten pretty frothy. Others have been well supported because there's a earnings uh, you know, turnaround happening and some of the hardware. Well, what appeals to you most uh, within the equity market? Yeah, I think it's still this kind of revenge of the of the 493, you know, these non-Mac 7 names uh, that are still pretty interesting. I mean, I think investors don't really realize, many of them anyway, that even though the S&P 500 was up 26% last year and obviously weighted average dominated by IT, uh, earnings was up less than 1%. And so I think this is a stock pickers market, not to be cliche, um, and there's, you got to look for businesses that are still growing their earnings in a what was still kind of anemic earnings growth environment. You know, right now, um, you know, Q4 earnings season's over. It, it ended up being 3.4% year-over-year growth. Q1 estimates are for the same. Uh, consensus is for that upgrading for the second half of the year to get a calendar 24 growth of 11%. And so that's a pretty wide chasm still to cross. And so I think investors need to be selective. Be very careful that you're getting companies with good earnings growth uh, and a market that, at least in the tech side, is pretty expensive. And I think that's the area where investors are over their skis. Mm. Now, uh, tonight, uh, we're going to get Adobe. I want to talk about this one because it's kind of an interesting uh, case study for AI. Does it help? Does it hurt? This is one where it may be a little bit more murky. What do you think? Yeah, it's a great case study, like you said, Oliver, for AI in general. Look, last year, like I said, 26% return on the S&P, no profit growth, really. What's happening here? 
we know what's happening here. It's basically this this feeling that either the Fed's going to cut a bunch of rates quickly, which didn't really happen, doesn't look like it's going to happen, or it's about AI driving incremental profit growth uh, for the tech sector, but also productivity improvements that translate to profits in general. And so to date, I think what you're starting to see, even in this earnings season, Oliver, is a separation of story and profits. So NVIDIA, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, the cloud hyperscalers, they're doing great. Everybody else, you know, they're still kind of suffering from a post-hanging, post-pandemic tech hangover. So things like Marvell, Technology, and Broadcom reported last Thursday, they're down 15 and 10% respectively, because what's happening is the tech hangover is oh, outweighing the AI gains. And so for Adobe, well, that's what we're also gonna be looking at, is is the AI really gonna be pushing the stock uh, in this release in terms of real profits or not? What's really interesting about Adobe is that you know, the guidance that management gave for 24 was only about 12% growth. Um, that's not really a lot for a business that was growing at 20% plus, given the fact that they're really hyping all this AI innovation. And so, you know, that was a bit odd because you would have thought that optionality would have had them a little bit more bullish. Now that said, this management team tends to be pretty conservative in their guidance. They've outperformed guidance for 20 straight quarters. So, it, you know what, it's hard to say what's gonna happen here, but suffice to say that the stock, when you add on stock comp expense, is 41 times earnings. The stock's up 80% the last 12 months. It's gonna have to deliver in this quarter. Yeah, for sure. All right, like the uh, stock specific preview here and uh, wrap it into the bigger picture conversation of uh, broadening out. Thanks, Eric, for your time. Always appreciate your thoughts. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Eric Lynch, Chart of Investments. All right, uh, a positive optimistic view still here on the broad market, but we're trading Adobe, Tom. Let's get straight into the trades here because you've got two of them. Yep. All right. uh, one's more bullish than the other. We'll start, start there. Up. Start there, yeah, of course. Uh, and taking advantage of uh, dispersion between implied volatility levels going into this earnings event. Uh, option markets pricing in about a plus or minus 7.5% move. So implied volatility in the near-term options especially is really elevated at this point. Um, so I looked at a strategy that takes advantage of it but gives myself a little bit of duration just over a month. Uh, in this, uh, I looked at a call diagonal where I'm going to go buy the uh, April options that are just out of the money to the upside, the 580 strike call. These were actually at the money earlier, but uh, stocks pulled back with the overall market. Buy the 580 call in April, uh, 36 days till expiration. And then against it, in the near term, the March 22nd weeklies that expire in eight days, I'll sell the 625 strike call. So I'm creating uh, this bullish $45 wide call diagonal to the upside. Now, if I pay a debit, debit of around 21 bucks, it's actually currently trading for about 20 bucks. So you get a dollar cheaper because uh, the stock has pulled back. But if you pay that debit of 21 bucks, that's going to be a risk, $2,100 per spread. But look here, Oliver, if we get that one standard deviation move to the upside, maybe even a little more, this apex is out at or near that 625 strike uh, over the next eight days. And then as you get closer to expiration on your short options, you can roll or adjust those creating credits. Uh, lowering your risk each time, expanding that uh, profitability uh, on this potential trade, but this is definitely bullish, but you're taking advantage of buying uh, about a 46% implied volatility out in April, the monthly cycles that you're buying the 580 call. Then in the near term, you're selling about a 76% uh, implied volatility on aggregate in that March 22nd weekly cycle. So that's where you're taking advantage of it. $45 wide call diagonal and you're only paying 21 bucks. That's a pretty good risk reward scenario if right. the stock rises. Okay, like that. Uh, so the call diagonal for some upside. Yeah. Camps out eventually, but gives you a good bit of room to run on the report. Yeah. What else you got? Um, just a, a neutral, taking advantage of that higher implied volatility levels I mentioned. The option market's priced in about a plus or minus $42 move either way in the shares, but it's been consolidating between its 50 and 200 day moving averages. If that continues, if we get no surprises to the upside or downside, uh, what strategy takes advantage of it? I looked at a short term, March 15th op option expiration. So just one day to expiration. Uh, on this one, where you're going to sell an iron condor here. And I looked at uh, selling the 540 strike put, buying the 535 strike put, and then on the upside, selling the 620 call, buying the 625 call. So I'm giving myself a little more room to the upside. 
um, on this one, so pivot it that way in case we do get surprised to the upside. But if you collect a, a credit of roughly about $2.30, that's what you can make on this. You got $2.00. Uh, in 70 cents in risk, but look at your break evens: 537.70 on the downside and 622.30 on the upside. So you got that nice wide range for it to trade in. If you think the stock's going to consolidate, continue to consolidate like we've seen over the last week and a half or so. This is the type of strategy that takes advantage of that higher implied volatility because you're collecting more option premium, mm. and then time decay and vol is going to get crushed tomorrow. Uh, and that should contract the price of this where you can buy it back cheaper. Okay, so overnight trade, mm -hmm. looking forward to stay within the bounds of what's been priced in for this. So right. the idea that maybe the market's looking for something a little bit too extreme possibly right. for Adobe. All right, interesting approach. Thanks, Tom. Two different ways to look at it.